Chris with Bob. Welcome to Breakfast with Bob. My name is Bob Babbitt. We're brought to you by the Pro Triathletes Organization. That's PTO, Amp Human, Velofix, Normatec Form, Swim Goggles, You Can, and our Challenge Athletes Foundation. Right before we got closed down for the pandemic, we sent out 3,921 grants, totaling $5.9 million to keep challenged athletes in the game of life through sport. Today is a special day. I get to interview two New Zealand legends. One, Mr. Rod Dixon won the, uh, took the third place bronze medal at the 72 Olympics. And 11 years later, 208 59 to win one of the most dramatic New York City marathons in history. Also from New Zealand, a gentleman who's won the Ironman New Zealand 12 times, Mr. Cam Brown joins us. How are both you guys doing? Oh, fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> Very cool. So, Cam Brown, how you doing, buddy? Ooh. Cam's got to take his uh, microphone on. Oh. Sorry, is it, you can hear me now? I can. Cam, how are you doing? Yeah, good, good. Yeah, no, we're uh, lucky to be in COVID-free New Zealand, so... Um, we're pretty much back to normal, but um, just the traveling restrictions. So uh, yeah, very, very lucky to be here though. So two legends from New Zealand from two different sports. Cam Brown, growing up, did you know of Dick Quacks and Rod Dixon and John Walker and all those legends? Oh yes, yeah, yeah, I did. Um, so the first time, I think I was 11 years old and I was up, uh, up north, top of North Island. And uh, I was uh, a young kid watching the New York Marathon and, um, yeah, pretty much that inspired me, you know, seeing seeing Rod, you know, finish that race and, and you know, it was only in the, the final sort of two, three minutes that he, that he caught um, and passed, um, what was his name again? Jeff Sorry, Smith. Jeff yeah, Smith, yeah. And, um, oh yeah, so I got inspired then and I went to, I think the hundredth, um, uh, sorry, yeah, the 100th time um, uh, John Walker did the, the a four minute mile at um, Mount Smart Stadium. So I can't remember what year that was, but I must have been yeah, 11, 10, 10, 11 years of age. And the, the whole um, stadium was just packed with people. It was quite incredible. Probably there was probably 20,000 people there for a, you know, to watch John Walker do that. So uh, Rod and John Walker, um, Dick Quacks, you know, they were just legends of our sport. And I think they, they encouraged, you know, Kiwis to think, hey, we can do this. We can take on the world's best. So, Rod, from your perspective, uh, triathlon didn't even exist when you were when you were first getting into endurance. When did you first hear about the sport of triathlon and, and meet some of the triathletes? Well, it was it was Bob Babbitt who was uh, the legend for me. Uh, you know, and and you went. I remember you went in. Uh, you went and John Howard. Of course, I I, uh, I knew John, and uh, and you. I said you're going to do what? You're going to run. You got, you, you're going to swim for what? Three miles and then you're going to ride a bike for a hundred and then you're going to run a marathon. You're crazy, you guy. What's wrong with you? And, and so, you know, that was, that was incredible to, to see that and fascinated because, uh, and of course, I followed John Howard who, who won it that year, didn't he? Was he the He's first? 81. Year? He won it in 81, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it really was, but, but you are my inspiration and that come uh, from, to follow that and what you were doing and how you were, uh, the, the sport was developing. And, and you were a huge factor in the promotion of it. And, you know, with all the other guys, Mike Riley and all those guys who I, I knew through Saucony in those days, it was just fascinating to watch it and to grow it. And then, of course, I met Scott Tinley and Dave Scott and, uh, you know, just some of the legends, just amazing. So, Ronnie, you got into running. Was it through your brother? Uh, yeah, well, it was like, uh, I, I think it was, I was four years old when I ran from my home to my brother's school and the, the school called my mother and said, uh, where's young Rodney? And she said, oh, he's out on the back playing. And she said, no, he's climbed over the gate and he's down here at Stoke School. So I, I guess I was born to run and I started, uh, at a young age, but my brother being three years older, I just wanted to be like my brother. He was my hero. And I just wanted to be like him. And, and uh, if, he, if he said I could run up a hill or down a hill or climb a tree, I believed him. And I just did it. I just loved it. And when did you know you could be good at this thing? 
Oh, really? It wasn't It wasn't until I was 18 or 19. Uh, I joined the running club. Well, in those days, it was called the Nelson Amateur Athletic Harrier and Cycling Club. And that was formed in 1896. So, uh, you know, this was a, a, a very much part of the culture of the community of Nelson. And uh, all us kids, when we were 12, we were allowed to join the running club. And I'd played soccer and rugby and hockey and basketball. But I, you know, I just, this running thing was just, hey, the, you know, they say go and you just keep going until they tell you to stop. I thought that was cool. <laughs> you told me this great story of, you know, wanting to be an Olympian and being in, in Nelson and sitting by the riverbank and listening to the finals of the 1500 meters from Mexico City, 1968, Jim Ryan, Kip Kano. What was it about that race and what about that moment that, really spurred on the rest of your career. Well, it was, it was, you know, we, 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 we would, I was running well and, and uh, I wasn't quite 18, I was 17. I was running well in the club and I would finish in the top five or six in most races. Uh, and then I remember we went down to the Mai Tai River and we were there on the transistor radio. And of course, remember that, that was, that was a wireless in those days, you know, it's transistor radio. Exactly. And, uh, <laughs> And we were listening and we had a few beers with us and, uh, you know, we were listening to the race and, and I said, Hey, this is, that's, this is me, you guys. And they, they said, what do you mean, Dixon? How many drink, how many beers have you had? And I said, that's, I'm going to go to the Olympics. I tell you, I'm going to go to the Olympics. And you know, incredible. Uh, I went to my brother and I said, that's what I want to do. And he said, you're halfway there. Now we just got to put the training in. And, and you'll come to training every day because you want to do this. And that's what inspired me was going and, and, and the journey started then. And four years later, I the Olympic Games. It's incredible. Well, and you were listening to Kano against Ryan. And then yes. when you go in 72, who's, who you lined up with? <laughs> kind of my right and kind of on my left. It was incredible. Absolutely incredible. And uh, and what was interesting the last few days, Bob, and, uh, you know, is it, the highlight and the sadness. And the, the, the highlight was Jim Ryan was by the president uh, at, at, with his award. And, and Jip, Ben Gipcho, who was also in that race, was African. He passed away two days ago. So it's been a bit of a mixed uh, mixed few days. And and now we're talking about what inspired me. All that has got to all fit into your journey. I'm, I'm convinced of that. So, Cam, what got you into the sport of triathlon? Uh, so I think in 1986, I was watching the Tour de France on, on our TV. We only had, uh, I think, two, two television stations back then in uh, 1986. It was, uh, and then I went to a new school, Pacaranga College, and uh, they had a lady, Patsy Lambert, who... Um, just you know, drove the drove the uh, kids to, to try and get into this new sport. You know, at secondary school level, it was it was quite popular. Um, and uh, so in '87, I went there and yeah, just fell in love with the sport. And that year, um, you know, Rick Wells uh, won the 1987 World Ch Triathlon Championships in Perth along with Aaron Baker. And uh, so Patsy rang up Rick and said, "Hey, you've got to come along to our school and talk to these kids and inspire them." And he did. And um, yeah, I've still got that picture uh, from the newspaper with uh, Wellesley coming to the school, and yeah, it was pretty pretty awesome to have have a guy that two months you know before had won the world championships, and he was he was uh, talking to us, and we were just in awe of him. He was uh, he was just a, a fantastic role model, and uh, taught us that hey, you know, Kiwis can can win overseas and, and win world championships. So when did you decide that you were good enough to become a professional triathlete? Uh, oh, I, I had quite good success early on, sort of that year. Um, I think I won the, the junior um, New Zealand junior championships mm -hmm. secondary school, and then yeah, just progressed. Started you know with the sprint distance, um, and then back then you know kids, uh, you know we were sort of fifteen, sixteen, and we were already racing Olympic distance. Um, nowadays, you know that kids that age can't even are not even allowed to race at that stage. You know Olympic distance, they can only do sprint distance. So uh, we were doing that. And uh, you know, some some of my friends were doing half Ironmans even at that stage. So uh, yeah, just started off that. 
and into Olympic distance and uh, just loved it. And you were you went pro in 1990 and you start you were racing in Japan. Right? There was yeah. a, a pretty good pretty good racing and pretty good money there, right? Uh, yeah, not to start like my first year and you know it was just. They paid my way up there and um, I lived with a, a Japanese family and um, and it was called Team Epson. Well, at that stage, it was just, I was the only one sponsored in the team. And then every year it got bigger and bigger and um, probably the final years, you know, there was sort of, well, there was probably about 15 on the team and, and you know, five or six um, full-time workers. So, you know, it, it got pretty big. And um, through those years in Japan, you know, the sport was thriving and, you uh, there was, um, you know, the Japanese, just like their uh, love for the sport of running, you know, they got it really got into um, triathlon as well. So um, those those 1990s in Japan were, were pretty cool. So Rodney, when you go to the Olympics in 72 and you get the bronze, how did that change things for you in terms of your, your moving forward as a, as a professional athlete? Well, I think... Uh... It cer certainly, it, you know, I, I mean, the goal was to, to make the, the semi-final. To, to, uh, you know, our goal was to, to qualify for the next round at, 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 because that was, that was progression. Uh, and, uh, of course, it happened. And I was into the semi-final, and then I was into the final. And that was, uh, uh, fortunately, um, of course, in those days, you didn't have anything, but, you know, you had to go over to the uh, communication centre and, and book a call. So I went in and I booked a call to New Zealand each day, heat, semi and final to call my brother, who's of course my coach. And, uh, and so, it, it, so after the first heat, I called him and he said, we, this is fantastic. And now he watched it on television. And uh, he said, that, so the next thing, you've got to run the same. He said, the good thing is in the first heat, you had Kaino who made sure that that third, lap was solid and, you know he ran under 60 seconds for that third lap which is perfect for me I get my I get my speed from strength and and so did Kaino so with the other some of the other runners they got their strength from speed so they didn't want to do that third lap hard so I knew to be up there with the leaders at least to have five or six yards on the others when it came into the last lap that I could hold my momentum so we said, do much the same in the semi-final. Go out with the leaders and stay with them and just and be there. Don't try and think you can run from back to front. Uh, so I did and uh, ended up, you know, uh, in, in fact, running the fastest heat uh, semi-final time and going through into the final. So everything from that point on was, you know, <laughs> Dixon and Wonderland. It was just pretty amazing. And... Uh, and I'll never forget, you know, when we asked to take our uh, tracksuits off and I put my gear into basket number three. <laughs> and I thought, whoa, this is cool. But, you know, I mean, there we go. And, uh, and then really, Kaino ran the race that was just perfect for me, um, taking it over into the third lap and, 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 well, just coming up into the two laps to go and pushing it hard. And that really sorted out the field. We weren't all running on top of each other and we were chasing really kind of, and that was just perfect for me. So really that result uh, was, was just amazing. And I remember about uh, five, uh, six days earlier when the New Zealand rowing eight had won gold medal and, uh, and they came back to the village and we all went over and cheered. And, and I remember Athel Earl he put his medal around my neck and he said, I want you to go out and get one of these. And I, and that was one of the first things I did. I looked up into the stands and I saw the New Zealanders up there and uh, we, we did a, we we're going to have a beer tonight. <laughs> and uh, so it was amazing. And, uh, and I remember I went to Athol and I saw him and I said, it's not, it's not the same color as yours, but that's, that's uh, good. Uh, it's good enough. And so really that did define what my future was going to be because now I had met uh, Pekka Vassala, the Finnish uh, athlete who had won. And he, the first thing he said to me, you must come to Europe and run in Europe and Scandinavia and, uh, and, 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 and do the European circuit. And so really that's what I did. In 73, we went to uh, 
uh, Toronto, Canada for the Pacific Conference Games. And I took this young fella who was with, with us on the team called John Walker to come with us. And I said, come on, you come with us. And, and he said, oh, I don't know, but I want to go home. I said, forget about home, come with us. And the rest is history for that young fella uh, and, and great, great friends. And we traveled for many, many years after that. But really it was, it was defined what it was. We were inspired really by Snell, Helberg, Bailey, McGee, who used to go to Europe and run some of the races there. And we uh, talked to Arthur Lydiard and we, then I said, right, we've got to make that. And Dick Quacks and Tony Polehill were much the same. We, and we were almost like uh, pioneers for our generation to go to Europe and compete and travel because uh, we couldn't go backwards and forwards. We had to stay there for a good five months. And so you learned that you're only as good as your last race. And so you, had, you didn't have your high peaks, but you just had to run consistently. And us Kiwis were able to do that pretty well. So, Cam, when, when I look at your, all your success at, at Ironman New Zealand, what's really difficult is New Zealand's in March, Kona is in October. To try to really, if you're training December, January, February to get ready for a March event, and then how did you try to balance both? Because you had success in Kona as well. You're second twice and third twice and I think uh, fifth or sixth and eighth. What, what, how did you do both? Um, I think just rest. Um, so I'd have three peaks normally throughout the year. So uh, uh, I'd start off, you know, training for New Zealand Ironman in March. Uh, then after that, I'd, I'd have a couple of weeks off and then build into the sort of the US season, do the early races up there like St. Anthony's and St. Croix. And then um, then I'd go on to uh, Europe and uh, I always wanted to race, try and race the best, just like what Rod, you know, mentioned you know so i'd always go to frankfurt or roth and um you know to beat the beat the europeans on home soil was so so hard and very few people had done it so year after year i'd go to france train there um, down the south of france um, and then yeah go and go and do frankfurt um and then roth and then have another few weeks off come back home and then i would um prepare over it go to go to gold coast or noosa in australia because it was just too cold. You know, I did one one build up in New Zealand, uh, I think for my first ever Kona and you just got to Kona and you just absolutely, you know, you just couldn't handle the conditions. So um, Australia was, you know, was, it wasn't quite extreme, but uh, it was perfect training weather. You know, it was anywhere from 25 to 30 degrees. So uh, it was it was fantastic and I was close to home and my family could, you know, all come over and uh, in those early years, the boys, my boys were very young. so. They had a great time, you know, five or six weeks in, in, on the Gold Coast. And then we'd uh, come back home for a couple of days and get all our gear and then head up to Hawaii. And then after Hawaii again, I would have a big break. I'd have four weeks off and then start preparing for a New Zealand summer again. So I was, I was just thinking about it yesterday, you know, um, this is the first time I've never done a um, Northern Hemisphere season in 34 years of racing. Wow. Since I was yeah, 17, I would always go to, you know, we'd, we would do back-to-back -back seasons and uh, we progress, you know, very, very fast. You know, our, our rise in the sport was great, but it, you did have to have breaks and rest. So uh, it was so important. Well, Cam, what do you look at as your, as your best Kona race? Uh, I think probably definitely 2005, you know, I got second to, to uh, Ferris Al-Sultan and, uh, my first second in 2001, Tim De Boom, you know, he just smashed everyone by 15 minutes that day. Yeah. He was uh, just off the front and he was just too good. And the, the conditions were just, I'll always remember that. It was just absolutely brutal. And, um, you know, I remember going, you know, we were riding sideways out to Harvey. It was just so strong. And um, that was a massive shock. You know, the first year 2000 when I went there was a, a big shock. But uh, I don't know, every year, I think the, the, the race was a lot, later in October and it seemed to the winds seemed to be a lot stronger in those those years and um but yeah 2005 you know I was um I think four minutes and 30 seconds behind um but even you know even when 2002 when I think I was you know shoulder to shoulder with uh, Peter Reed and Tim De Boom for quite some time in the marathon as well you know there were special moments as well very cool and Rodney, when were you keeping tracks what was going on with with Cam Brown and Terenzo Bazzoni and? Yes, yeah, I, I was. Um, uh, oops, 
Am I still going? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, well, that's you know, we I had met uh, Cam. When did we do uh, Crash of the Coast? Crash the Coast. Um, so yeah, we, there was a uh, series in New Zealand that uh, it was called Clash of the Coast, and uh, it was it was this concept was sort of brought up by um, Stephen, um, sorry, um, Ian Ferguson, and um, what was oh, the other kind of yeah, Paul, Paul McDonald. McDonald. Yeah. yeah, that so they won the Olympic Games in was it Seoul for um, uh, uh, biking? For, uh, Los Angeles and oh, was yeah. Yeah. yes, yeah. yeah. And so they brought up this concept of you'd have three members in a team, and um, and then there was all these different sporting codes. So you'd have rugby, you'd have Rod. Rod was in the the Masters um, yeah. section, weren't you? So you had yourself. Who else was in your team? Uh, Alison Rowe and uh, 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 Ferguson. Ferguson, yeah. and I, and my team, I had um, Steve Gurney, who was ten, ten time coast to coast champion, and, and Sue, Sue Clark, who was a, a triathlete as well. And then you had all these sporting stars um, in these teams, and, and we, we competed in, in all these crazy, crazy sort of days. And you you travel all around New Zealand, and it was awesome. And I, that was where I met Rod, and that was I think nineteen ninety five, maybe or something. And yeah, I think it was and, about ninety four, yeah. ninety five. And that yeah. was when I I just noticed this young kid. Uh, how old were you then, Cam? You're probably 25, I think. We're 25. So, yeah. uh, but you know what? What it was was that you were, um, uh, you just had you had something about you. You know that that, uh, um, you know, it was that you had foundation. Uh, you, you and you had that sparkle in your eye. And I just said, this this kid's good. This kid's good. And uh, and then we. So I I really started to follow. And of course, Rick Wells, uh, yes. very much so. Rick was a great friend and and. Uh, um, uh, did events with him um, and so but that was that was you know really the, the start of my uh, uh, following the New Zealanders as much as I was very involved with you know Scott Tinley and and uh, um, uh, Dave Scott in those days you know, with, with uh, and I remember one year we did a, um, a super team and we had um, my, uh, uh, Paul Asmuth was the swimmer and he was, um, I think he won Alcatraz or something like that. And yep. then there was John Howard, the cyclist, and me, the runner. And uh, and we had a team. And I think, uh, I think, oh, we won. Yeah, we won the uh, Bud Light World Championship team title. Yeah. The United yeah. States Triathlon yeah. Series. That's right. Yeah. And so I, I uh, met, I got to meet a lot of the athletes then. And I was, I just blown away that these, these, uh, I mean, I would train, yeah, I would train two hours, but you, those guys were training four and five hours. You know, it's like incredible. Back, back then, I remember there were so many races and uh, you'd, they'd combine all these sporting stars, you know, your, your best swimmers, your best bikers and runners. And I've got a, a picture of um, a New Zealand triathlete magazine and, and Rod was in, I think you were sponsored by Diamond Pasta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For yeah, the yeah, and I think yeah, yeah. You, you won, um, it was another team race. Um, and, and some of these races had, you know, $10,000 up for grabs and you know for the for the winners if they broke a certain record and, and back then you know that was 1987 88 that was a heck yeah. of a lot of money so um, yeah. it was yeah. quite a few races and, and there was one particular race in, in New Zealand where um, Frank Clark um, a Canadian triathlete and you had to go under 50 I think it was 54 minutes for the sprint distance race and uh, if the woman they had to go into say an hour but um, if you missed out then that total was combined into into the pool so Frank Clark uh, ended up winning twenty thousand dollars in this in this in this race back in you know I think nineteen ninety and there was like wow that was yeah. a huge yeah. amount of money you know so uh, there was a big 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 piss up at the bar that's for sure that that day. <laughs> so Cam, throughout the nineties, at that point we didn't have the triathlon, didn't get into the Olympics till two thousand. So when did you make the change from you know sort of shorter distance races to deciding yeah, probably- to go long? So you know, when I was racing in Japan, you know they they were trying to push me to you know try and qualify for the Olympics, and I I, I you know I was trying and trying, but I just didn't have the speed that um, you know Hamish Carter, Bevan Doherty had, and you know I, I was fine swimming and biking, and and um, but when the rate when the uh, ITU turned to drafting, uh, that just you know I'd, I'd had a couple of thirds and fifths in the in the ITU World Cup circuit, and I think I got six in the series one year, but. Uh, I sort of had, I had just had to change because my strength was not in, in 10Ks, you know. Um, so I wanted to give Ironman a go. I'd watched the race as a 17-year-old up when it was in St. Helier's, Auckland. 
and fell in love with it. And, you know, that was when Scott Tinley, Scott Molina, Dirk Ashmanite, um, you know, Mike Pig, Dave Scott all came down to New Zealand to, to race because back then in, in you know, those early years, there was only four or five Ironmans around the world. You had Canada, Tipton, you had Japan Ironman, you had um, Hawaii Germany. and Germany and New Zealand, and that was it. So if you won one of these races, you were just a superstar. Nowadays, you know, we have, um, you know, 50 of them around the world. So if you win an Ironman, it's not much of a, a big deal. But um, back then, yeah, it was right. incredible. So um, I decided, I think my first Ironman was 1997 in Auckland. Uh, and yeah, I, I got my ass kicked and it, I learned a lot and I um, thought, wow, you know, I'm going to have to change things up. So um, I went and saw Scott Molina, you know, who won the Hawaiian Ironman World Championships in, in um, 88. Yep. And, uh, you know, sort of after his services, because I knew he had done everything in the sport. And, you know, so, and immediately he doubled my training and uh, I'd gone from, you know, riding three, 400 Ks a week to 800 Ks and running, run, trying to run 100 Ks on top of that and then swimming, you know, 20 Ks. And so it was, yeah, my, my training doubled and I was 40 hours a week. So it nearly killed me, but um, <laughs> I had success with it as well. So, um, yeah, those, those early years were, were pretty tough. It was a big so, change. Over. Rob, you were talking. About, we were talking about you know, your people training and racing with some of these legends. Tell me a little bit about your relationship with Steve Prefontaine. Well, that that uh, my first uh, introduction was to Steve was in uh, seventy two in Oslo, and uh, there's a fabulous uh, uh, YouTube on it um, where he 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 set the American record for uh, three thousand meters. And uh, I'd run the 1500 the day before, but I, I, uh, part of my training is we, we've decided that you run the 1500, you want to you know, run as close to 343, which is a four minute mile, you want to do that. And then I want you to go out and run the 3000 because I want to base, this is John talking, I want to base your strength at the moment, where you're at with your strength, not so much your speed, but your strength. I want you to do a four minute mile, and then I want you to go out and run the 3,000 meters the next day, which I did. And pre, pre uh, Arnie Haugbeck from, um, uh, from Norway uh, led out, uh, took the lead out. And I could tell that that was a little bit too quick for me. And, uh, and pre ended up winning that. I was uh, fifth, I think it was, in that race. But, it, it, you know, there again, this was not the Olympics. That I knew what I had to do. And... Uh, uh, and I went to shake Steve's hand and he, he was far too busy. You know, he was too busy with the media and everything else. So we, uh, and then, uh, of course, he ran the 5,000 meters in uh, uh, Munich. And then after that, we went to London for the uh, World Athlete, uh, Athletics um, at Crystal Palace. And I was in the two mile. And uh, once again, Steve basically went to the lead and uh, and push push the pace. I kind of got up from fourth to third, and then sat him behind him. Uh, and I thought this, you know, I mean, this, there was no point in trying to take him for the lead. He was the perfect pace maker. And uh, so with 250 to go, I swept round him and and won it. And I set a Commonwealth uh, and New Zealand uh, two mile record pre uh, set the um, US record and I went to shake his hand and he he said you just sat on me you da 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 and, I, <laughs> and he wouldn't even shake my hand and I said all right whatever <laughs> so uh, then then uh, 73 at Europe uh, we came up against each other in Stockholm and uh, we ran there and once again I ran a two mile and just missed the world record he was fourth but he didn't do all the tight running. He didn't all the, do all the pacing this time. And so he was amenable to shake my hand. And then the next thing is we, I go to Milan in Italy and he turns up and we look at each other in the, uh, the uh, um, lobby and he said, oh no, not the bloody Kiwi. And I said, oh no, not the bloody American. <laughs> and or Ralph Mann, who was the, the hurdler, he says, you two guys, you better get together. He said, you know, I can, I can see the tension between you. And he said, why don't we have a beer tonight with dinner? And so we uh, had a few beers. And he said, uh, 
you know, uh, uh, um, who's with me? Uh, Walker, John Walker. Was John with Walker, me. who was with me, John Walker. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and I think we said at that point, okay, we had more than two beers here. We will have a run. We will do training at 7.30 in the morning. You can drink, we can drink all night long, but we're going to have training at 7.30. And we had an agreement. So, of course, we got up at 7.30 with hangovers and we went out and we ran for an hour and a half and I tell you what, that we we ended up having a hug, high five. We said, "This boy is as good." So we dedicated him as an honorary Kiwi straight away. We loved him; he was a good boy. And so from that point on, to sadly his passing in '75, we were great mates. We communicated on the phone. Uh, he was going to come to New Zealand for training in '75 for the summer uh, after the indoors, uh, as he prepared for '76. Uh, for the Olympics, and uh, we were going to go to Boulder, Colorado, uh, to train with him. Uh, but sadly, uh, we lost him in May of 1975. But up until then, a great mate, great friend, uh, and, uh, and as I say, an honorary Kiwi. We gave him that status. I love it when you went, when you imagine this, uh, you, Rod Dixon, John Walker, and Steve Prefontaine <laughs> out for a run. And I think you guys sort of worked him a little bit. Didn't you go yes. off the front <laughs> and then Pre would chase you down and then yeah. Walker would go and you guys were tag team. How long did you guys tag team him before he realized what was going on? Well, he, he went almost the hour and a half. I mean, it was like, we were, we were, and he said, oh, you guys really run hard, don't you? And I look at Walker and I go, we never trained that hard, <laughs> but but it was you know we just wanted to see what it, you know how much depth he had in it. He was a he was tough. You betcha he was tough. And I in fact about a month after that we were in Turin in Italy, and uh, he was running. A, he ran a mile, a two mile, a two one mile. He had a, ran a mile, had fifteen minutes recovery, and then ran another one. He ran four oh three. And then he had 15 minutes recovery and ran 3:59.2. We couldn't. I couldn't believe it. I mean, that was pretty good. Pretty damn good. And that was. Wow. It was definitely a mile. It wasn't. It wasn't. Wasn't just four laps of the 1600, four meter, 400. It was definitely. There was a mile mark, and we checked with um, Franco Fava, and he authenticated that that is the mile mark, and he went out there and did it. And I was pretty blown away by that. So, Rod, I was looking at results from. 76 Olympic final, right, at 5,000. And I think there was like less than a second yes. separating Lassie Viren, Dick Quacks, Klaus Hildebrand, and Rod Dixon. Yeah, right? less than a second. Like, you, you, yeah, less than a second. Four you places. Can't, you can't snap your fingers and in, 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 <laughs> in a second. <laughs> and, unfortunately, you were the guy in fourth. How hard was that to live with, knowing you were that close well, to a medal? Well, I, I, you know, we the four of us, of course, were brought together because they had to do the photo finish because they weren't sure about third. And and uh, they came out after the, the photograph and they looked at Varen and said, come this way. And then they looked at Quacks, come this way. And then they pointed at Hildebrand and come this way. And then they looked at me and they said, bye-bye. You know, it was like, oh, my God, that was it. And... Uh, yeah, but I ran. I ran back to the uh, ran back to the village. Ran all the way up to our twelfth floor and sat on my bed and cried. And uh, but I I realised, you know, because a voice came into my head, and it was it was my mother. And she she said she said Rodney, you get off that bed and go back to that stadium and embrace what the Olympics are about because it's not about you. You shouldn't be disappointed. You are a champion get up off the bed, continue to compete because you believe in yourself. And I did. And I went back and I watched the rest of the racing and that day. And then from that point on to the end of that season, no one beat me. I beat, I beat all the Olympians. I went to uh, England and won the three A's, beat Moorcroft and Clements and Sebastian Coe. I won the British 50. Nobody could beat me. But that was just, I just put that down, not as a regret, as a disappointment. And we're going to have disappointments. We're going to have highs. We're going to have lows. But we get up and continue to compete because we believe in ourselves. And that's what I see in a lot of the, the athletes of my era and, and, and uh, 
and Cameron, you know, all these great athletes, they, they know what it takes to get up and continue to compete. So Cam, when you win a race 12 times, the, and you're a Kiwi racing at Ironman New Zealand and everybody's expecting you to win. How hard was that to deal with just knowing all that pressure was on you that, and obviously people from other countries, they want to knock you off in New Zealand because that's, yeah. you know, you're the guy. Uh, yeah, well, sometimes I couldn't wait till the week was over because I, I hated it. The pressure was, it got that bad and so immense. Um, there was, I think, 2001 when I was, uh, well, yes, I was second um, at Hawaii Ironman. Then I'd, I'd won New Zealand Ironman for the first time. And then I won Sportsman of the Year that year. Um, and for 2002, I was coming in and I was, and oh, it was, you know, it was so hard to just year after year try and, try and try and win but uh, I think you know I just I just love you know that training for three four months leading into New Zealand Ironman and I, I wouldn't know what to do with myself over a Kiwi summer uh, if I didn't you know do that race so um, you know since since um, you know 1999 I've, I've done that that race every single year and I wouldn't change it you know I just continue to love it and um, as, as Rod said you know I think uh, I mean I think I look back on those guys and, and just saw just hard work pays off. And, um, and, and, you know, you have to be smart about your training as well. But uh, I think what those guys did in the day was quite incredible because, you know, there was no internet, there was no fax machines. Even, you know, when I first started in the sport, you know, you used to fax a, a race director to, to come to a race. But back then, I don't even know how they, you know, would enter. You know, you'd have to send send some mail away for, and you know, they might get returned three weeks later. Yeah, yeah, you can race, and then you just turn up in Europe and thinking you're going to race on some particular day. Whereas, you know, I mean, this time in the world where you know we can be, you know, they can you know, say a race is not going to happen tomorrow, and and you know you can stop it, but uh, we can't get on a plane back back then. You know, you had to decide. Right, I'm going to Europe. And that's it, you know, I'm going to be spending my next six months in that, in that country. So what, you know, Rod and John Walker and, and the greats did back then, and early before that, you know, when Peter Snell, you know, they had to get on a boat to, to, to go to some of these races, you know, and I mean, Crazy. it's incredible, you know, so it's quite amazing. So I look at what we do now, it's, it's pretty easy compared to, you know, those old guys. But that era of, you know, the, the 80s in, in New Zealand running was just incredible. You know, we had so many great runners. Um, and, and I think they just, they, they they just, it was, they drove off each other. You know, there was just, you know, someone was pushing each other. Every year there was someone new coming through and and every race, you know, they, they were doing low, low, you know, two tens, two twelves, two sixteens. I remember a guy, Rex Wilson, um, I think he was from Tokoro, wasn't he, Rod? Yes. Yeah. And, he, and um, um, yeah, there was just so many guys that, you know, I think you'd have 20 or 30 guys that would run sub 220. You know, nowadays we've got two guys, the, Zane Robinson and, and, and um, Jake Robinson, you know, the two brothers. Um, they finally beat Rod's uh, record um, from 1983, you know, New York Marathon in 2000 and I think 19 uh, at the... Um, uh, and a race in Japan, so it's it's taken you know nearly forty years for that record to be broken. So, I think that says a lot about sports science. You know, so many people get scared away. Oh, you can't run one hundred and sixty miles, or you know, a, a week, and that you you know you can't do that. That's not right. And but what they did back then, you know, it was you know, it, it was just new and it was raw, and and they went out and they did it. You know, they had a beer afterwards, and it was fun and it was unique. <laughs> Nowadays, everyone's too scared. You know, oh, you can't do that. Don't do that. That's stupid. You know, but. That's what you did back then. You you learnt. I mean, I remember um, reading the. I think it was back in probably the 1989 uh, Triathlete magazine, and um, they had this thing on curb running. And um, it's so a joke. Know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I for a, for a, for a 17 year old. So I was running up the Pakaranga Highway, uh, doing curb running, running one one foot on on a curb and the rest on the other. And I did it for a month, and I, I got the US because I'd always get the US Triathlete magazine, and I read it, and it was a massive joke, and it was just <laughs> trying to get people was, out there trying to learn to do different stuff. And it was April know. Fools. It was an April yeah, Fools yeah, joke yeah, that you're yeah. supposed to run next to a curb rod, and you know, have then then run back and forth, left foot up, and then right foot up, coming the other way. <laughs> I remember that. There must that have was been actually, so many people around the world doing it. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I love it. Hey, so Rodney, as, as Cam mentioned, you, John Walker, I mean, you're traveling together, right? Rooming together, I'm assuming. Yes. And then racing together, trying to kick the other guy's ass. 
and yeah. then doing it again the next week. How hard was that? Because this is like your best mate, but yeah. you still want to win. You want number one. Yeah. Well, it, actually, I, I, uh, in, in 19, I got married in 1974. And, and please don't tell too many people about this, but in 1974, I got married. But in 1975, I spent more time in a bedroom with John Walker than I did my, my wife. Because, you know, we had, to, we had to go and travel. And we went away for six, seven months on the go. And, you know, there was never one day where John and I had a disagreement or we couldn't agree on something. It was just incredible. Him and I had just an amazing relationship. It was like a brother. He was like a brother. And we respected each other in our training. Now, you know, John would want to go to the track and he'd want to do certain, you know, 400s or whatever, and he wanted to do them in, six, in 55, 56. Well, that was too fast for me. I said, no, John, I'm not going to do that with you. This is what I'm going to do. And so, and, and, and I say, but it, I would have to do 10 of those or something. And I said, but there's a couple in there that I will run with you, but the rest I'm going to do this. And then John started to learn too what I was doing and he adjusted his training so that we actually functioned very, very well training together. Now with the long runs, uh, I mean, I could, I, I was much, I had a much more of an aerobic capacity than John. John had a better anaerobic capacity than me. So we understood that. And so by our long runs, he would come with me and he would just turn around and come back. Uh, there was no trying to race each other. We learned very early, you don't race your training. You train your training, you race your racing. And so that's what we understood. And, and, and functioned amazingly. Now, yes, there would be certain times where we would race each other um, and, and, and really we would go for our morning run, we would have lunch, and then we would back to our room to prepare and rest up. And then by the time and we would walk to the stadium or get picked up to the stadium, but once we're in the stadium environment, we did our own thing. And we came to the start line and we raced each other. And uh, it was just an incredible, incredible time, incredible journey, and how we functioned. It was just amazing. And that's, I love the man. I love John like a brother. Unbelievable. When you were training for the New York Marathon, what was your, what was your biggest ever week? Um, there again, keep the highs down, the lows up. So I maintained consistency. I wanted to do 14 weeks of about, and of course, in, in those days, Cam, I was, uh, you know, full time. So, you know, you trained in the morning, you trained at night, you had long days, you had summer, uh, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, good eating. So, I mean, I, I, could, I was comfortable running around 120 consistently during the week. But uh, oh. there would be the, some of the evening runs in the forest would be a little bit more fat, like a little bit of uh, speed play. Uh, I used to love running through the... The, the dense forest because of the the uh, tree roots, and so you'd learn to do agility, balance, coordination, and uh, because the long slow runs would 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 that was what would make you long slow, but that was the aerobic capacity you knew you had to build into your uh, well, it was like the pyramid really, wasn't it? Is the pyramid of training. So the foundation was the most important, and that wasn't about uh, how fast you ran; it was consistency. And so those, those, that's how we train. Well, 120 miles, Rod? Yeah, 120. And so on race day in that 83 New York City Marathon, it's funny because it's for a lot of people who didn't watch track and field, it's like, oh, this brand new guy, this guy Rod Dixon we've never heard of before wins <laughs> New York City Marathon, right? That, that was sort of the coming out party for Rod Dixon at that point. Everybody knew who you were because Jeff Smith is leading most of the race. And the last couple hundred yards, you're, you're running the tangents, it's raining, you catch Jeff at the last part of that race. For me, the hardest part must have been staying the course and not trying to catch him all at once, right? Because you, could, you knew he was up there, you knew he was coming back, but you didn't want to get outside of your comfort level and blow up. Right, yeah. Well, I, I, I knew based on my training, uh, and I set a time, I set a, a goal, 
of, of 2009. And from that, I actually wrote my splits on my fingers. I think you might have a picture of that. Bob, I do. Yep. Where I wrote the wrote my splits of five mile, 10, uh, uh, 15, 18, and 23 were my split times. And of course, so I went out there and, I, and it was my brother John said, he said, you have to stay with your plan. Do not be influenced by others. Run your own race. Stay with it. Be confident. And so that's what I thought to myself. I'm going to do this. But I, I always used to like uh, other, uh, to draw other runners into running my race because no one's going to beat me at my race. But sometimes, you know, like the marathon, you have to run your race, which may not be the same as somebody else's. And you realize, you know, you, you plan all this. This is part of your training. And so really, I just stayed with, I stayed with that. And when I went through five mile and I was right on my split time, um, my 10 mile time, I think was about 10 seconds off. My half marathon time was, was right on. My 13 miles was very, very close to it. Um, uh, oh no, 15 miles, 15. But 18, I think I was nearly 20 seconds off, 20 seconds off. So, uh, but I, I, but it was starting to rain and, and uh, rain harder. And, uh, and then by the time I got to uh, 23 and I took that off within, within just a few seconds and I said, I'm running the race of my life, but the leaders, you know, <laughs> half a mile up the road. But I just stayed with that. And then when I started to realize, you know, uh, and the shorter parts in the Bronx where the, the straights, you know, I'd come around the corner, he was gone around the next corner. And so out of sight, out of mind. But you, you had to believe and stay with that pace. And then about 23, ABC television had uh, these spotters on bikes that would come alongside you and they would give the feedback to the studio exactly where Dixon was because you know the spectators were telling me 10 seconds half a minute of two minutes they, they you know you couldn't believe them <laughs> so but once that spotter was with me I was listening to him talking and I was listening to the conversation he had with the studio and I knew exactly where Jeff Smith was so then when I started to see Jeff and I noticed that he was running the blue line. In those days, they ran the blue line or painted the blue line in the middle of the road. And I knew, and remember, as Cam knows, Scott Dixon is, is part of the family and he's an IndyCar racer and he knows you've got to run the tangents. You've got to run, you race the tangents. So I knew the shortest distance from point A to point B was through the tangent, not in the middle of the road. Uh, and And so... I realized then that I was starting to gain uh, uh, a distance on him. And I realized that running those tangents and he was running the other, that I was saving myself two or three seconds per, well, two or three yards more than anything. Yeah. And so when I thought well, we've got 30 more uh, corners, I'm, I'm a hundred yards and there's my 12 seconds I'm behind or 15, 18 seconds up I'm behind. So I started to realize and get confident from that, that now I was, I was picking up, I wasn't running any faster. He wasn't slowing down, but I just wasn't having to run the distance. And slowly but surely by Columbus Circle, I knew that I was, I was going, this was gonna be the race of the lifetime. And, uh, and right at 26 miles, I caught him. It was just extraordinary. But I realized, too, that I used to run races where I'd say, if I make, if I get 20 seconds on you or 10, uh, 50 yards on you, I, that's only, that I'm prepared for you to get that back before I make any more effort. I'm not going to try and keep that 50 yards. I'm going to let you, make you work harder to get that 50 back than I did getting it. And so I felt to myself, maybe he is just waiting for me to catch him. And then it's going to be a sprint to the finish. So I knew to run the, the, the game, the lower side of the road. And when I got alongside him, I ran as hard as I could so that he would look over and I was flashing past, whereas in fact, he wouldn't want to try and catch me. And that's, and that really was the decider of it all. That, uh, um, I, I got, I got past him 
And then, of course, I was running scared that he was going to run me down. But uh, two corners, three corners, 385 yards is the only time I led the marathon. <laughs> That's all that matters. <laughs> <laughs> and Cam, one of my favorite all-time races, and I'm, I'm sure it's – one of those races that you love because of how fast you both went, but not you didn't like the result very much, was that first Ironman Melbourne uh, 2012, you and Craig Alexander. And you guys, I think you ran 240, he ran 238. You guys were side by side for pretty much that whole run. Take me through that because that was a, a pretty special day. Yeah, and that was pretty cool. I mean, you know, uh, in the early stages, the first sort of 10 kilometers, um, there was uh, Aniko Lanos, uh, Freddie Van Laird, uh, myself and um, Craig Alexander. And I think we went through the, um, I've you know, still got the Garmin um, results in that. And I think we went through the first 10K in sort of 36 minutes, um, which, you know, it's not fast in general run terms, but when you've you know, swam 3.8 Ks and ridden 180 Ks to... <laughs> To then get off and run that quick, and Craig kept because he didn't have a Garmin watch, so uh, he was asking me for the splits. It was kept going off, and you know, I'd be saying, you know, yeah, 3:30, 3:30, 3:30, and so yeah, that's pretty quick early on in a in a marathon. And we just, you know, we dropped the guys early on, and from that that point on, we just kept running shoulder to shoulder. And uh, I think um, you know, multiple times I had the lead, and you know, got sort of five, ten meters on him, and then he would do the same. And uh, it was probably about the 37, 38 k mark that uh, he finally sort of broke away. And um, at that stage, I was sort of happy with, you know, second, Craig sort of got a good gap and, and took off. And um, uh, I think um, um, Freddie was two minutes behind me and um, I didn't realize we were so close to going under eight hours. And uh, I got to the finish line and it was eight hours and 12 seconds. And I know I could have gone under eight hours that day. And, you know, it's the only thing I haven't done you know, uh, it's pretty special going to that eight-hour barrier. And, uh, yeah, so I was, I was so annoyed that, you know, because people had told him, all the Aussies had said, right, you're going under eight hours, keep going, keep going. And, and none of them had bloody told me. So um, I needed a few more Kiwis out in the course to say, look, you, you're going close to, and I would have sprinted that final, you know, couple of Ks. But, um, hey, that's racing and, uh, you know, you learn. But, um, yeah, it was pretty special. And uh, I think uh, that... <laughs> That ruined both of us for a while. I think put uh, Crowley in the box for a long, long period, and he uh, he didn't come back for a while after that. And uh, you know what's fascinating about I that? I, I think I got plantar fascia because the camber of the road was so bad, and the uh, so I think I had that for about eighteen months after that as well. I think when you look back at that, you had uh, Crowley winning the seventy point three worlds in September, Kona and breaking a world record, going what eight oh three in in October, and then being forced to run 238 to win Melbourne in March. And I don't think he was the same. Uh, mm -hmm. You put three world-class performances that close together. I, I don't think the body recovers for quite a while. No, no right. yeah, it takes time. And, you know, I think, uh, and I, I was the same, you know, it took me a long, long time to recover and uh, a lot of rest. And um, yeah, as I said, yeah, I think I had 18 months of plantar fasciitis after that. So it was uh, pretty tough on, on the body. So Cam... Um, or just you know, with, with Rod and, and his splits. It's quite yeah. amazing. Back in the day when all you had was a, a stopwatch and I remember my first Ironmans, you know, I just had a normal stopwatch and you know, I always wanted to try and run four minute K pace or under. And it was all right for the first sort of 10 K, you, know, you, you, you know, you're going through you know, 2 K in eight minutes and 3 K in 12 minutes. And, but then, you know, you'd get to a certain point of, you know, 23 Ks and 33 Ks and you're trying mathematically trying to get that into your head. Oh, what am I meant to be running and, and going through these splits? You know, you, I couldn't have a whole list of, you know, splits on my hand. So it's, I mean, nowadays with the GPS watches, it's just so easy. You're just running along and you just glance at it. Yep. You're running on target. And, and back then, you know, I think, and that's, where you know guys like Rod and that, they had so much experience running on the track, they knew bang exactly what pace they were doing, and probably a lot of athletes don't realise you know, how good track running is to to know your pace, know your your judgment of yeah what you know what steady state, what hard, and and uh, we all just you know go off this too many times now, and I think perceived effort and, and running is very very important. I think everyone you know needs to learn it and uh, that's what I've tried to do and you know follow those guys and how they did it back in the day and I think it's very very helpful. So Cam you're are you 48 or 49? Uh, just turned 48 in June yeah. 48 and you're still racing as a pro? Yeah yeah. If someone had told you this 
back in the day <laughs> in the early 90s that you, you're going to still be racing as a pro. And not just racing, you just did uh, New Zealand. Were you sixth place? Yeah, sixth place. And, you know, as I said, uh, five weeks of running and uh, I still, you know, did eight hours 12. And eight hours 12 uh, on probably uh, 11 of my wins that would have won it hands down. You know, I think my, my fastest winning uh, uh, was an 8.07. Um, and, you know, it's it continues just to evolve and get faster and faster. You know, the swimming and running has not changed much, but the advancements in biking and the technology there, the aerodynamics is really, we've gone so much quicker on the bike. And, um, you know, people are still, you know, swimming 48, 47 minutes. They're still running, you know, around... 240, 245 um, on the run. But yeah, the, the biking, you know, we're seeing, you know, four hours, 12 minutes and just all the time now, you know. And I, I was watching Mecca uh, on a podcast with uh, in Australia and, you know, most, so many people go under eight hours now. It's incredible. And it, it is. It's just the advancements on the bike have, um, you know, really, really um, made, you know, massive progress. Because it's funny, you look at, you know, 89 Ironman with Dave and Mark, right? The, the, the swim times and the run times, 240, 241, and the swim times, it, it's really the bike. If you yep. look at the major change between then and now, it's, it's yep. all the bike. So it's, te it's the technology, it's the, uh, the just the aerodynamics, getting in a wind tunnel, doing all that type of stuff. Well, I, look, still I, look at some, I look at some of the, my positions in the past and yeah, they're just shocking compared to what we, we are in nowadays, you know, the, was just so much more aerodynamic on that bike, and yeah, it's um, it's amazing. Cam, will we see you as a fifty-year-old pro? Yeah, yeah, that's my that's my goal now is to to be racing um, <laughs> until I'm fifty. Um, and I'm yeah, uh, as long as I stay injury-free, and and uh, that's the thing nowadays. I, I can't really rest as much as what I'd like to, and um, so I'm I'm having a break now just because I mentally need it. It's it's been a tough year with you know no racing. Um, for you know for the next six months so um it's just time to rest the body and, and i'm just ticking over at the moment uh, whereas in my 30s i would have four weeks total break doing nothing putting my feet up but nowadays i just can't do that it's you know going out for a mountain bike and, and going for a, a 30 minute run just to keep the body ticking over and and you know keeping it supp supple and, and just uh, things working otherwise yeah i'll just fall apart and first run back i'll be injured and out for six weeks you, you sound like Rod Dixon. Rod was really one of the first elite runners to get into mountain biking and riding, the, just riding the bike, right, Rod? You were early yes. on realizing that you can't do all that pounding. Right, exactly. And I, and he, he lives in one of the best places in the world to uh, mountain bike too, so. Yeah, you betcha. And I, of course, you know, when, and when I was uh, wanting to be the first 40-year-old uh, to run yep. a sub four and a mile, and I, I was training with the 49ers at uh, their facility and uh, Jerry Attaway, who is the strength nutrition coach. And uh, we and I did a lot of water running. Uh, so we, we, uh, it was heart rate based uh, to get the heart rate up uh, wonderfully. There was a, it was a salty pole, so we didn't have the um, uh, chlorine to deal with. Um, but it, it, what we did understand is that a lot of a lot a lot more of the aerobic training or an, anaerobic training I could do in the pool rather than going out there and pounding myself. Um, and so, and then I learned to uh, you know start bringing in the bike uh, as a supplement to the evening run. So, you know, you'd run that two and a half hour uh, run in the morning, and then you go out and do forty five minutes at night. But no, I went I went out on the bike, and I found my recovery was much better. I stepped up massage therapy uh, to two days a week. Um, I stepped, uh, got into uh, to, got into yoga. Uh, I got into and and doing a lot more walking. I found that walking uses more muscles than you do when you run. So I started hiking more and building my connective tissue uh, through hiking in the mountains and the trails. And that's why I used to go up the Mammoth Mountain a lot and do uh, altitude train, walking, hiking, rather than running. And all that started to, to balance out nicely. And I was, I was all set to go, but I just didn't expect getting viral pneumonia from an uh, air conditioning unit. And then that really completely put me out for six months. Couldn't believe it. 
Hey guys, thank you so much for taking so much time and, and going down memory lane with me. I, I love talking to legends from different sports and the fact that you guys have been connected over year, years it makes it even better. You guys yeah, are the best. Hopefully, me and Rod, we're going to hopefully uh, meet up in a uh, relay in um, Christchurch in September. So yes. uh, if That's not, we'll get him in the van and he can uh, pass his beers along the way. <laughs> that would be great. Uh, hey, and I've got to tell you guys, yeah. um, I, I just had my 70th birthday this month, and my daughters bought me a Cube E mountain bike, 160. And I tell you what, that is the best thing I've ever had in my life. I'm going out there. You're cheating. You're cheating. Unbelievable. I love it. But I, I, I tell people you're not allowed one till you're 70. Exactly. I turn 70 next year. So I'll get one. Better <laughs> boy. Hey, guys, thank you so much for taking thank so much you. time. Always thank such you. a pleasure. Again, Bob Babbitt here, Breakfast with Bob, brought to you by the PTO Pro Triathletes Organization, Amp Human, Bello Fix, Norma Tech, Form Swim Goggles, You Can, our Challenge Athletes Foundation, and our First 27 years, we've now raised $123 million, sent out 30,000 grants to athletes in 103 different sports in all 50 states and in 73 countries around the world. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time. See ya.